Hey everyone, today for module one, we'll be talking about the carbon reactions. We'll start with where they are located and what happens and how they're connected to the light reactions. Then we'll talk about the three phases of the Calvin cycle and then we'll finish off with what limits photosynthesis. Picking up where we left off before spring break, let's return to the site of all the action, the chloroplasts. We previously covered the light reactions, which take place at the thylakoid membrane. The products of the light reactions were the formation of ATP, as well as the formation of NADPH. And now it's time to connect those products to the Calvin cycle. And it's in the Calvin cycle where we will be talking about the fixation of carbon or CO2 molecules. I feel like we can't talk about photosynthesis without bringing up the equation at least once. So here it is. It takes six CO2 molecules and six water molecules. It requires light and the products are sugar and six oxygens. CO2 gets reduced, meaning it gains electrons and water is oxidized, so it loses electrons. Here is the full Calvin cycle shown in a diagram from chapter eight. There are three main phases, carboxylation, reduction, and regeneration. We will mostly focus on the first phase, carboxylation. I want to emphasize in very general terms what is happening at each phase as opposed to focusing on the many intermediate reactions it can take to get from one phase to the next. So let's just think inputs and outputs. Before we get into the phases, I want to point out that there is an emphasis on accounting for the number of carbons. So this symbol on the top left corner here, this represents a carbon. This is important to consider because in order to understand how many molecules of CO2 must be fixed in order to create sugar, we need to know how many carbons are coming in and what happens to them. Starting with phase one, carboxylation. I view it as the most important phase because several things are needed to start the Calvin cycle here. First, we need ribulose 1,5 biphosphate. It is called RUBP for short. If you want to know why it has this unusual name, it's actually quite literal. We have five carbons here, and the 1,5 simply refers to the location of different phosphate groups. So we need one RUBP to act as an acceptor and to merge with CO2 molecules. And these CO2 molecules have actually diffused in from the atmosphere. In order for this merger to happen with RUBP and CO2, we need an enzyme to catalyze this reaction. So in comes Rubisco, our enzyme to the rescue. After Rubisco catalyzes the reaction of RUBP merging with a CO2 molecule, we end up with a six carbon molecule. This is actually quite unstable and it immediately splits in half. This gives us two molecules of a three carbon compound, three phosphoglyceric acid, or three PG for short. And again, the three is representing the location of a phosphate group. So in summary, phase one, carboxylation, we have an RUBP acceptor. It's accepting the CO2 molecule. This merger needs to happen via Rubisco, and we immediately get two of the three carbon molecule called 3PG. In the spirit of a typical lecture for Plant Phys 206, I'd like us all to take a pause here to think a little bit more deeply about this first phase of the Calvin cycle. So during this particular phase, carboxylation, what would you say limits photosynthesis? Press pause to think about this for a couple of minutes. Now that you're back after pressing pause, I will tell you that it's all three things. What limits photosynthesis? RUBP, Rubisco, and CO2. I'd also like to ask you to think about how CO2 concentration would affect overall photosynthesis. We know that CO2 molecules are part of the overall equation for photosynthesis. So if we just continuously get an input of CO2, do we also continuously get an increase in photosynthesis? So again, press pause to think about what this graph might look like. Now that you've taken the time to draw a graph for yourself, I'd like to show you the type of graph that I would have drawn. Intuitively, it makes sense to me 
that if we increase CO2 availability, that we should also see a continuous increase in photosynthesis. And it's a graph that looks something like this. However, it doesn't work that way. So we will explore this in a future module to express how exactly CO2, Rubisco, and RUBP play together in order to impact overall photosynthetic capacity. So let's move on from the carboxylation phase. Just to recall that we have two 3PGs right here, and these two 3PGs will move on to the second phase of the Calvin cycle. So each of the three PGs that were created from the carboxylation phase move on to the reduction phase. This is where we first see the products of the light reactions come into play. So each of the three PG molecules will become reduced by NADPH and phosphorylated by an ATP. So again, we are gonna do this for each one of the three PGs. So in total for this phase, we use up two ATPs and two NADPHs. After these two three PGs have gone through this reduction phase, we end up with two G3Ps. And G3P is short for triose phosphates or glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. And those are the basics I want you to take away from the reduction phase, meaning we are just thinking about how we take these two 3PGs, they get reduced by NADPH, they get phosphorylated by ATP, and now they have transformed the 3PGs into two G3Ps. It's important to note here that each G3P can have two different fates. One, it can go on to the regeneration of RUBP, or it can simply move on in order to form sugars. If it moves on to the regeneration phase, the third phase of the Calvin cycle, then we need simply one ATP to phosphorylate the newly formed G3P. At this time, we don't need any more NADPH. So this all seems quite simple, right? If we have two G3Ps, it simply splits off. It could become a sugar or it could go on to regenerate RUBP and therefore keep the Calvin cycle going. But I want to bring us back to the issue of accounting for the number of carbons. As you may have noticed, I've gone through the Calvin cycle in the simplest of forms, as in we have used only one RUBP, and that is the acceptor of a CO2 molecule with the help of Rubisco. This then yields two molecules with 3PG that go on to form two molecules of G3P. Now, if we look at the overall equation of photosynthesis, as you can see, we need six CO2s, um, and we are also in the process of needing the light reactions and the products of that. We are also using six waters in that process in order to get this sugar and the output of oxygen. So to build up from simply thinking about one CO2 molecule that goes through the Calvin cycle, I'd like to just kind of build up a little bit slowly. So let's think about three CO2 molecules. So we have three RUBPs and three Rubiscos, and we have three CO2 molecules coming in from the atmosphere. And once these all merge, we should end up with three six carbon compounds. And again, these are very unstable, so they immediately split in half. And what this gives us are six 3PGs. And these six 3PGs will also require each ATP and NADPH, which means in total we will have to use six ATPs and six NADPHs during this reduction phase. 
And here's where we have some interesting things that happen with these six 3PGs. After they've gone through the reduction phase and have been reduced and phosphorylated by NADPH and ATP, only one of them is going to go on to become sugars, and the other five are going to go on into the regeneration phase. The regeneration phase is really interesting because it's not as simple as taking five ATPs and doing something with each of these G3Ps. What in fact happens is a complete reshuffling of this entire group of the five G3Ps. In total, it will require ATP, but not five of them. In fact, it'll only require three. And after we get this reshuffling of all these G3Ps, in the end, we magically will end up with three RUBPs. And of course, it's not magic. If you want to read more about this in the textbook, uh, you can find very specific reactions telling you about how exactly do we go from five G3Ps in order to form three RUBPs. But I also want to bring up the point here, we started to slowly build up to forming one full sugar as we saw in the equation for photosynthesis. So obviously in this particular slide, we've gone through the Calvin cycle using three CO2s here. And of course, this only gives us half of a sugar. So what we need to do is all of this over again times two and we will get our full sugar that we see in the equation for photosynthesis. That's it for module one today. Your main takeaway should be first, where is the Calvin cycle and how is it connected to the products of the light reactions, in particular ATP and NADPH. Second, what happens in each phase of the Calvin cycle? Third, what limits photosynthesis, in particular during phase one of carboxylation? And finally, how are CO2 molecules processed as they go through the Kelvin cycle to help create sugar as well as regenerate RUBP? Okay, this is Chimichanga, the famous Chimichanga. So we both wish you all a good week. Thanks for watching.